Next, Dr. John will present a similar approach using fact wrapping. Thanks, Jamil. So, um, so obviously the aesthetic goals are the same, whether you're using synthetic fillers or fat, and so we'll cover some of the details about uh, fat transfer to address the same issues. My disclosure is really not pertinent to fat transfer. Um, so when I think about fat transfer and, and marking out the areas to be addressed, to break it down into superior and inferior periorbital peri regions, and then inferior periorbital region, we break it down further into superficial and deep, um, addressing uh, the, the superficial only in the, in the inferior region. Um, further blending it into the anterior and lateral uh, cheek, lateral cantus, and temple. Some advantages of fat over fillers, um, we both use plenty of both, but uh, some of the advantages of uh, fat transfer are that it is natural and there are some patients who demand uh, that type of approach. Uh, it is durable, I have my own 10 year results, which I've been very pleased with. Studies have shown, the Glasgow did a 3D uh, study which showed uh, about 32% uh, retention at 16 plus months. And I know Dr. Dr. Williams has uh, published a paper which showed three year retention um, in about 85%, at least a mild retention. Um, there's no Tyndall effect possibility, as we can see when we go superficially with HA fillers in the tear trough in particular, and that can be challenging to get a perfect result as, uh, as a result. Um, there may be a stem cell effect. It's certainly not something that we guarantee to anybody, but, uh, but that is something that uh, we, we may see uh, skin improvement at about a year after a fat transfer. Um, it may be combined easily with other procedures, blepharoplasty and facelift in particular. Less so with brow lift, depending on your plane of elevation, you don't want to just fill into a, a large empty cavity. Um, the equipment is quite inexpensive, probably the best ROI you're ever going to get in plastic surgery. You can probably get all the equipment necessary for under $1,500, maybe $1,000. Some disadvantages, there's additional downtime of probably a second week in most cases. We're trying to whittle that down as much as possible, but, uh, but a lot of patients won't accept that second week, and so HA fillers would be a, a good choice in that instance. But um, uh, that and in the uh, imperfect predictability. So in our hands, it's only about a three to 5% touch up rate at a year. We do ask people to wait a year to make sure that the fat is fully stable. Um, and uh, thin patients are a little bit of a challenge. Finding donor material, of course, is more of a challenge in a thinner patient, but we can usually find some. Uh, older patients tend to have a little bit res less retention. Uh, and of course, if a patient is gonna have unstable weight, they need to know that they're, while they're um, the rest of their body can enlarge the, the transplanted fat will as well. Um, one disadvantage of it being durable is that it, if you overfill, then that's going to be there a long time, but happily that's not been our case. Um, and of course, you want to be careful about intravascular injection. So just briefly about the technique, these are common to both Jamil's and my technique. Gentle harvest with a 10 cc syringe, three millimeter cannula, gentle back traction, about no more than two cc's on the plunger. Um, process it through centrifugation in our hands. It's, studies have not really shown a, a big difference in any of the uh, processing methods, but in, in this case we do 3,000 RPMs for three minutes, discard the, uh, the top and bottom layers that you don't want and you have the nice healthy fat in the middle, transfer that to one cc syringes and then infiltrate that with 0.9 and 1.2 millimeter cannulae, multiple planes, multiple passes, injecting only on withdrawal to try to minimize chance of intravascular injection as with uh, HA fillers. And typically, especially in the periorbital region, we only do about two to five passes per 0.1 cc. So just a quick video, if we can run that briefly. Just showing the approximate rate of, oh, previous, yeah, of infiltration. Previous slide, there you go. Rate of infiltration in the inferorbital re rim region, palpating with a non-dominant hand. Yep, there you go. Palp can you mute that, please? Palpating with a non-dominant hand. Um, in order to protect the, uh, the eye and the uh, infraorbital uh, rim region. So knowing where the infraorbital uh, foramina, uh, foramen is, uh, is, is key in staying uh, superficial to that. So we just walk along the infraorbital rim, medial and laterally, deeply, and then uh, go a second pass more superficially to get the rest of it. A couple little stutter steps to get in the right position and then injecting only on withdrawal. So then advancing to the superior orbital rim, if you could play that as well. For the medial injection we usually start with, we typically access that from about the vertical position of the mid-pupillary line or maybe the medial limbus. Again, injecting only on withdrawal. Again, about two to five passes per 0.1 cc. And then laterally, we access it from just above the lateral canthus. 
Importantly, for the infraorbital rim, I wouldn't address the uh, infraorbital rim from the lateral acanthal region. People have seen uh, sort of a sausage type of uh, swelling from that, and I think that's because of the ligaments that Jamil referred to. Um, the, the fat can accumulate along the, the tear trough ligament and the orbicularis retaining lig ligament when accessed from that position, as we showed earlier. The, uh, the approach for the infraorbital rim is from uh, inferiorly about at the point of the tip of the nose, horizontally. It's okay, we don't need to show that. So just a few examples showing mild, moderate, and then more advanced atrophy um, in the periorbital region and, and the amounts of fat that we'll use for, uh, for those instances. It's a patient, typical patient that presents for a little bit of hollowing underneath the eyes. She was mainly interested in, a, in the neck and jawline improvement, but uh, was happy to know that she could get some improvement in the dark circles. So for her, we only did three cc's along the infraorbital re rim region, uh, two medial, well, one medial lateral, deep one superficial, and then blended that with the uh, three and two cc's for the anterior and lateral cheek, respectively. A little bit lateral acanthus. So while she was happy with the jawline and neck, she was equally happy with the mid-face improvement. Patient a little further along the uh, volume atrophy spectrum, uh, we ended up using two cc's along the superior peripheral region as well as the inferior region. And I think a nice improvement of the uh, hollows, both superiorly and inferiorly, in addition to the neck and jawline. Patient more advanced atrophy, kind of pushing the limits a little bit of, of what's possible for the, uh, for the superior periorbital region in particular. She has exposure of practically her entire upper lid, um, and so we use four cc's along her superior periorbital rim region and, uh, and four along her inferior rim region as well, and blended that, blended that as shown. One of the things I like to notice is that the, the lateral canthus, or the lateral, uh, the tail of the brow frequently gets picked up a little bit. I think that's because of kind of a pendulum effect where the skin serves as the string of the pendulum and as you apply volume, it extends, of course, not backward where the bone is, but anteriorly and superiorly because of that fixed length of string. Uh, of course, that analogy breaks down if the skin quality is poor. And then also with volume loss in the parable region, the, uh, the bony atrophy that occurs causes an expansion superiorly. So if we're trying to do a brow lift and, uh, or wanting to do a brow lift and, and think that our goal is to begin and have the brow begin and end on the uh, orbital rim, then if that's expanding superiorly and we don't realize that, we're gonna be chasing that target superiorly up the forehead and, and I think that's one of the reasons why sometimes brows are over elevated. So this can be done with synthetic fillers as well. Um, you can achieve some nice highlights I think around the eye this patient might appear that she's in her perhaps 40s uh, with uh, not much exposure of her upper lid, not much hollow in the tear trough, but she's actually in her 50s. And so um, a pretty, pretty quick and efficient filling in the office can give, I think, upwards of a decade improvement uh, in uh, invisible age at that point. For guys, just be much more conservative. While he might have had a similar amount in the inferable rim region, we did not do any of the anterior lateral cheeks. And in this gentleman, we did a little bit more. Uh, we did a little bit in the anterior lateral cheek, but, but only a third, uh, as you can recall, uh, relative to the, to the female patients. And I'm glad we didn't do a bit more. I think that preserves his masculinity while still giving him a, a rejuvenation. So any enhancements for the future? We've actually begun to use PRP uh, with, the fat, with fat transfer procedures in a ratio of about 10%. So I'll use about one cc of PRP to nine of fat. I think anecdotally, I think that there's maybe a little bit of uh, improved retention and decreased swelling and bruising. Um, either way, it's certainly in the past year that I've been doing it. Uh, I haven't seen any uh, sort of turbocharging of the effect, which is a, is a concern. I was happy with the, with the retention that we had. I was mainly trying to decrease the downtime, trying to cut that second week down. Will stem cells have any role in the future? As we said, the, the skin quality seems to be better about a year out after, after fat transfer. An animal model is also showing an increased uh, thermal thickness through new collagen formation um, in the area over which fat was transferred. So that may be playing a role as well, but uh, stay tuned. And, and some are using um, nano fat, they call it, where um, the fat is basically strained even further uh, and then injected such that there really aren't any viable fat cells and, uh, and seeing, uh, they say, some improvement. I have not tried this myself, although I will inject uh, the fat as uh, process as shown with a 22 gauge needle into lines, and I, I think there is some improvement with that. So in summary, volume loss certainly occurs in the periorbital region, and uh, we think it's a gratifying area and a powerful area to treat both uh, with synthetic fillers and with fat transfer. Thanks very much.